What's up, gum fighters? I want you to pontificate on this while I go through the preamble to the episode. You cannot cheat if there are no rules. Today we're going to be talking about bug out guns and kind of a Semper Gumby philosophy. Always flexible. Thinking about that kind of be adaptable and thinking outside the box because as much as we like to talk about guns I mean this is gunfighter life after all critically thinking and thinking outside the box are likely to have a way bigger impact on your survival than what caliber you have yeah I said it if you can't adapt and think outside the box and be flexible you're gonna have a way harder time surviving I don't care what your arsenal is so let's apply that to today's episode on Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about guns, gunfighting, tactics, the right way with almighty God at the center, Judeo-Christian values, and real-world first-hand experience. I'm going to put in the bio. If you want to skip it, skip right around two minutes. A lot of things have a 30-second fast-forward. For those that are need help on the math, that's four taps on the fast-forward button if it's 30 seconds. Two minutes. And we'll get into the main topic. I'll roll into a quick abbreviated bio and then into the main topic. First and foremost, I'm a Christian. I don't apologize for that. God is number one in my life. I grew up hunting and fishing in the backwoods of the southeastern United States at a very early age. Some of my earliest memories are with firearms. I joined the Marine Corps at 17, did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. By God's grace, he got me through that safely. After that, I served as a instructor, an urban warfare instructor and a desert warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps. I also served with the LAPD, both full-time as a sworn police officer and some more specialized assignments, as well as serving in the U.S. Army, full-time and part-time National Guard. I've been a FBI firearms instructor, still am an FBI firearms instructor, have been for a lot of years. Also NRA certified and some other three-letter government agency certified. I've been a private contractor for a three-letter government agency I won't specify. I've been the commander of a tactical team in a large metropolitan area. By God's grace, he got me through all that in one piece, not because I'm better, but because he chose to have grace and mercy on me. I've been a professional hunter and guide. Professionally hunted things like buffalo and elk. Not many people today can say they've done that, but I'm blessed to be able to say that I have. I've hunted everything from white-tailed deer on the east coast to mule deer on the west coast to gray squirrel on the east coast to prairie dog on the west coast and elk and bear and wolf and slain all manner of beast. A state rifle and pistol champion a few times over in a few different disciplines. Enough about me, guys. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and fingers for battle. Let's get into today's topic. You can't cheat if there are no rules. Now, there is a stupid, ridiculous saying, there are no rules in love and war. That's ridiculous. There are absolutely rules in love and war. They're laid down by God. There are rules for just warfare and unjust warfare. There are rules for love as in who you can and can't love some love is good and healthy as in between a man and a woman in marriage and some is an abomination some is disgusting and vile so with that being said there are no rules in bugging out as long as you don't violate any of the moral ethical laws that god lays down because god's law does not change it is It is not transitory. It does not change with the political winds or with whatever the rule of law is. God's law for justice, mercy, that's still in place. But whatever guns you have to pick from, there's no malum in saying that. So whatever guns you're going to bring, that's pretty much wide open. So often on the bug out gun debate, and I like doing these mostly because I like to think And do the thought experiments, right? But and often a a debate that we've talked about here before and that I talk about often on Patreon is if you could only have one long gun, 
what caliber would it be? And there's the the big debate, kind of the big two that always kind of rise to the top, are the 22 versus the shotgun. And we've talked about that. Like which one? One you can carry more ammo. One's way more flexible. One's way more powerful. One's quieter. There's pros and cons. We're not going to rehash out here today, but there are some ways to maybe think outside the box about this. I'll talk about some of the ones I dislike the from the my least favorite to kind of the most favorite ways to think outside the box here. <laughs> All right, now my first one is going to be the gun adapters, like shooting different calibers out of your shotgun. These are a real real kind of common thing and I think they're more memey than they would be actually practical in this situation but not that they wouldn't be impractical at all I think they're really cool and a lot of fun if you don't know what these are these are basically metal inserts that you put in the tube which is basically what a shotgun barrel is right it's a basic tube a metal tube and you can use these with single shots, you can use them with double barrels over and under or side by sides. And you slip these in and you can go from, let's say, a 12 gauge to a 20 gauge or from a 12 gauge to a 410. Or, and you can't do high pressure rounds like a 308 or a 30 out 6, but you can do lower pressure rounds like a 38 Special, 22 Long Rifle. Kind of make your shotgun more of an omnivore as if a shotgun wasn't flexible enough already. That's a, It's a really cool thing and... and it's really neat. So you could think outside the box this way and think, I'm going to get my break open single shot shotgun and have a 12 gauge and then have all these adapters so that when I come across all these battlefield pickups that'll be all over the place, I can scrounge all this different ammo. Which I'm not... I'm not Again, we're thinking outside the box here. It's pretty cool that you can shoot different calibers, and you know that I love the shotgun. Here is my my main issue with this, is you're relegating yourself to single shot or two shots. Which is fine if you have one attacker. Maybe if you have two attackers and you get good hits. But what if you got four or half a dozen? Then you have an issue, right? If this is your your... Your big long gun, the one you're going to be carrying, then you have one or two shots. I would rather have a pump or a semi-auto without the ability to use the adapters. Because I think that's far more likely than I'm not going to have any 38 Special ammo, but I'm going to have an adapter and I'm going to find a box of 38 Special. Again, not saying it's... It's it's definitely adds some flexibility. And if, if your one go-to gun... Your long gun for heading out into the wasteland is going to be, if it's going to be a double or single barrel shotgun anyway, you might want to have a couple of these in common calibers. Although I would not go forego the rate of fire for the flexibility. The other issue is that I don't think they're going to be highly accurate. Would it be pretty cool to have one of these adapters and throw it in if you're running, let's say, a trap line and you want to dispatch things caught in a trap so you don't have to waste a 12 gauge round and you can just use a 22 round yeah that's pretty cool and i could see some utility there but again what happens if you run into four dudes that want you dead and want your stuff and think your gun adapters are pretty cool again i, I would either ha rather have a pump or semi-auto shotgun or just go with like a semi-auto 22 or something else with a with a reasonable rate of fire so that's why i've always kind of not really thought about those but they are definitely an option now let's talk about another option. Uh, the military did for a time, the Air Force has some pretty cool rifles. They did have the M6 survival rifle. I think it was originally in 22 Hornet, which is a cool caliber. But also you can get rifles like this in 22 Magnum and 22 Long Rifle over 410. This is pretty cool because you get kind of that big debate of... Do I pick the shotgun or do I pick the 22? Well, with this, you get both the shotgun or the 22, which is pretty cool. Um, that's pretty neat because all the flexibility of the shotgun, you know, 
people kind of scoff at a 410, but a 410 with a good defensive load like Triple Lot Buck is nothing to scoff at. It's a decent, close in defensive load and gives you all the flexibility. You know, you can hunt deer with 410 slugs. Especially like a good 410 Bernecki slug. If you if you do the research and pattern your shotgun and know how to do it and keep it in a reasonable range. But I would definitely rather have a Bernecki slug to take out a deer than a 22. And you can take out a deer with a 22 as well. But it's going to open up a lot more shot opportunities for you than you would with just a 22. There are... You can take a deer out with a 22 and certainly many have. But you're limited to very specific shot opportunities. And very specific locations because the whole point that you're shooting it in this rival situation is to eat it. If you shoot it and it runs off and dies two days later, you probably don't have the calories to waste to track it down. And you just wasted a round of ammo and gave up your location. Like let's say you're you're moving from one location to another because this is a bug out scenario, right? So let's say you're, you're bugging, you're hardcore bugging. And you jump a deer, right? If you have triple lot buck... In your 410, I would take a good quartering away shot with triple up bucket close distance on a deer. I wouldn't want to take that shot with a 22 because a good chance I'll hit him, I'll wound him, and he'll run off. And I've done all the things we discussed. Give away my position, and I don't have a deer, and I wasted that round of ammo. So you get the idea. <clears throat> also, you know, you get the flexibility of the shotgun for waterfowl, uh, upland game, pheasants, quail, deer turkey depending on what's in your area right you get the idea it's it's pretty cool and they didn't just make these these those air force survival type rifles they only made in 410 but savage made a lot of different versions of this in different calibers and there have been other companies like bacall but savage are probably the most common to make combo guns and there's some real versatility there in the combo gun. They did things, I believe, like 223 over 20 gauge. That one's really intriguing. Something like a 3030 over a 20 gauge. If you're somewhere like, let's say I'm, if I was picking a caliber option for here, where I'm at, which is northern Idaho, like Canada, Montana area, just west of Montana, just south of Canada, a lot of big megafauna here. And 3030 will take care of all that. If I could do something like a 30-30 over 20 gauge, if I was picking a combo gun, that would be pretty intriguing, and they do exist. And I didn't come up with this. this is something Pastor Joe Fox says of Viking Preparedness. Uh, he's one of the people that I'm a patron of. And uh, he says the two things are going to get you in, you know, Tiawaki or SHTF or whatever you want to call it, is starvation and people behaving badly. Well, for starvation, that's a pretty good option. That's a pretty good, legit deal. But the people behaving badly. Again, we're down to two shots. So, you got one round of shotgun, which is definitely good if you got a good defensive load in there for a threat. And then the other guy gets whatever caliber you have. 22. A one round of 22 for the other guy. And then what about the third and fourth guy? I guess you could shoot and run. Be good at sprinting and reloading. But you get that's kind of why it's not a great option so here's where we think outside the box here with either one of those the options we've heretofore discussed you pair it with a good semi-auto combat handgun right you pair any of those with a Breda 92 or a sig 226 or if you want to slum it go with a glock 19 or a glock 17 whatever it'll it'll put rounds in a general direction <laughs> i'm just kidding I, I don't i don't uh I don't hate Glocks. They just, you know, they have the ergonomics of a 2x4 and the trigger pull of a stapler. But they'll definitely get the job done. I've run a Glock as a professional contractor, law enforcement officer. They'll get the job done. I'm just kidding. Whatever. But you get the idea. You pair one of these options that has a low rate of fire with a semi-automatic handgun. So if you get in a sticky situation, you dump the shotgun round. Maybe the 22, or maybe you just dump the one shotgun round and go straight to straight to work with your semi-auto handgun. So you practice your transitions, you get one shot, you put that long gun down, and you go to your secondary. And then you've got a reasonable rate of fire. And that'll work fine if the threat is pretty close and you're good with a handgun. If the threat is, you know, a decent, like, 200 yards away, and you're not a great pistol shot... 
and they have a semi-auto rifle and you've got a single shot shotgun and a semi-auto handgun you get you get where it's not the best solution here but it's definitely a lot more viable it's definitely a lot more palatable and you might think of this as a really good option especially if you live in like the swamps of the southeast like where i grew up where it's hard to unless you're just walking through an open field which if you're bugging out don't walk over an open field during the day that's just a bad tactic why would you do that why would you walk down a road why would you walk down an open soybean field right you you walk over a field at night if you're trying to cut distance in the fog at night new moon but that's just like fieldcraft 101 and if you stick to the woods in the swamp and even urban suburban areas you can't see that far anyway so the long distance thing is kind of a moot point because unless unless you're just doing something silly or really desperate why would you go anywhere where somebody can see you 200 yards away and for that you might think yes yeah, semi-auto handgun and one of these kind of options because a shotgun is a great putting meat on the table tool and you got your semi-auto handgun and again we're thinking outside the box that's not the worst idea ever in fact I, i'm warming up to it the more i kind of pontificate on it here with you guys <clears throat> so those combo guns that's that's a legit thing or if you paired the single shot double barrel with the adapters with your handgun now let's talk about the two long gun debate and this may not be as ridiculous as it sounds especially not saying that you couldn't do this if you live in a free state in america but in some places you can't even have a handgun like canada oh canada so for them they're probably not bugging out with a handgun because you're not allowed to legally have a handgun so that means a lot of them probably don't and if they do, they probably don't practice with it a lot if they're not actually supposed to have it. And a handgun you don't practice with, handguns are the hardest gun to master. So, again, you're largely taking that off the table for our Canadian listeners and for our Australian friends and, uh, you know, some places in Europe. So for them, it's off the table. Um, or some places, I think, in Europe, you can have like a semi-auto handgun, but it's got to stay at like a club. So I don't know what good that's going to do you. But... For whatever reason, let's say handguns off the table. And this may not be as ridiculous as it sounds. A lot of people will say, you know where it's at for bugging out? It's all about the M1A. A man's man's rifle. Grow chest hair while you're shooting. And hey, I, I actually have a lot of experience with an M14. It's a, it's a decent rifle. M14 unloaded weighs 9.2 pounds plus the ammo. 10.7 with a loaded magazine per Wikipedia. It's a big girl. And that's talking about the M14, which is going to be comparable to a standard M1A. Um, not even talking about like a heavier barreled version. We're just talking about straight M14, M1A, 10.7 pounds with a loaded magazine. Now, with a lot of these more modern AR-10s, still a 308, which is a good option, I think. 308's a good caliber for this. There are options in good modern AR-10s that are under 7 pounds. And guess how much a Henry AR-7 survival folding packable 22 weighs? 2.5 pounds. If you did some quick survival math, you realize it's lighter to have one of the newer AR-10s or something like it. I'm not married to the AR-10. In fact, I'm not a big fan of direct impingement for a survival scenario. But even a lighter weight piston AR, you get the idea. You can get some good options and carry a decent 308 and have a semi-automatic 22 and still be underweight of what you would be with an M1A. One of the reasons I no longer own an M1A. I, I did have one for a while, but I also had a SCAR-17, which is a fantastically accurate, good semi-auto that weighs far less than an M1A. I'm not saying you have to go with a SCAR-17, but if you get a lighter weight, 308, you could pair it with a 22. Even that Henry AR-7 semi-automatic, packable, foldable, which makes a lot of sense in this scenario, and still be under the weight of an M1A. 
and a lot of people would think the M1A is a good bug out choice. So it's not as ridiculous as it sounds, especially with one of those foldable packable 22s. Because here's the deal, if you're in a non-permissive environment, you're probably going to have your 308 or your AR-15 rifle out and on you and ready. And the 22 can be stowed in your pack. When you get somewhere where it's less of a threat, then you might go hunting with the 22. But you can still have it in your pack and have the option and have a decent amount of 22 that doesn't weigh a whole lot. That's one of the big advantages of the 22. And you might be able to carry a little bit less 308 ammo, but you can carry a lot more 22 ammo. And I think that's a that's a really good, intriguing choice. Now, that Henry Air 7 is not the only game in town. There is a lot of really good and affordable, like, very small, like, youth model bolt-action 22s. You can go single shot for this. You could go semi-auto. If it was my only gun, I would want a semi-auto. But again, this, in this scenario, is not your only gun. This is a special purpose gun in your pack, not your main long arm. So it's not as ridiculous as it sounds if you have a lightweight option. Now, if you're going with an AR-15 anyway, AR-15s tend to be lighter. If you go with a good lightweight one and don't hang a bunch of superfluous, ridiculous stuff on there, that probably isn't going to work anyway. You stick to a basic you know, sling, optic, good, lightweight setup on your AR, and then you also have a 22. there you go. But if you have an AR, you could also do the 22 bolt conversion kit, and then you just have to carry the bolt conversion and some mags. The issue there is they're not as inherently as accurate because you're dealing with a different bore diameter, you're dealing with a different twist rate, usually, you know, your standard 22 long rifle twist rate is going to be 1 in 16, and your AR twist rate is going to be like 1 in 7 is popular today, 1 in 8, 1 in 9. It's not exactly the best. It probably wouldn't be as good for hunting or as accurate, but it's still an option, and it, you wouldn't even have to carry a whole other rifle. But, again, going back to, you could have even a 308, a lighter weight, because there's a lot of good lightweight modern 308s. And have the Henry AR-7 in your pack, and you're still under what the weight of one of those giant beasts of an M14 is. And again, I like the M14. It's a great rifleman's rifle. It's it's beautiful. I love shooting iron sights with an M1A or an M14. But they're heavy. And a lot of people think that's a great bug out option. I'm going to tell you a big reason the military got rid of it is because it weighed a ton. And the ammo is heavy. So... I like 308. I think it's a great caliber, and I think it's probably, if I'm picking a rifle, and that's not usually my first choice, if I'm picking a rifle for a long gun, then 308's a good, good choice, and you get all the flexibility of the 22. So I would forego quite a bit of 308 ammo for a lot more 22 ammo, because you're going to have to eat, and the point that you're shooting something is to eat it. If you're shooting a deer, 308 nice if you're shooting a quail 308 not so nice you get a lot more flexibility with the 22 so that's pretty intriguing now you'll know that my main go-to there's no other caveats it's not like i'm peeing in a radiator and it's world war three and cubans are parachuting out of the sky it's not a red dawn scenario just you give me no other caveats just it's the end of the world as we know it i'm probably grabbing a shotgun i like the shotgun because it's so flexible you can do the same thing with the shotgun you forego a little bit of shotgun ammo for something like the ar7 and quite a bit of 22 ammo then you have a lot of flexibility i don't want a 22 in a defensive scenario but i'll take a pump action shotgun in a defensive scenario it's one of the most devastating small arms at normal defensive ranges period and i got the 22 if i want to be quieter more clandestine and i don't want to waste the shotgun ammo because it's it's quite the resource the other thing to think about that i think makes more sense if you can have a handgun is think about having a 22 handgun because and this here's the big caveat if you are good at hunting with a handgun because here's the thing, hunting is hard. 
Hunting with a handgun is much harder. I do and have done quite a bit of hunting with a handgun. I do it because I like it. I've taken more deer with a handgun than I can remember. I've taken more small game with a handgun than I can remember. But I don't do that because it's easy. It's very hard. If you think you're going to go out and learn how to hunt during the apocalypse and you've never hunted before, I'd say that's a poor plan. That's a that's a very poor plan. You know, the first day or two, might you just roll into the city park and shoot a stupid squirrel or two before they get wise? Maybe, but everybody else is going to have that idea too. Hunting is a skill, and it's a lot more than just the caliber that you pick. If you're a decent hunter, and if you're really good with a handgun, and you can couple your field craft with your handgun ability, you absolutely can hunt with a handgun. I know because I've done it quite a bit. So if you did something like, this may sound crazy, but roll with me here. We're talking, it's the apocalypse. So we're going to be getting crazy anyway. You do something like pair your 308 with a 22 handgun. Now your 308 is your primary. If you're getting into a gunfight, you should be getting into it with your 308. If something happens, you get a malfunction or whatever, you transition to your handgun. 22 not ideal, but it's definitely better than staying in there looking at a broken gun. And again, you get the flexibility. Small game. You probably don't want to hunt small game with your 308. Also, it's not your primary, and you can carry a lot of ammo. You know, a decent lightweight 22 with a brick of ammo that's 500 rounds plus a sidearm that weighs very little. If you're capable with it, that opens up a whole lot of doors. So you got a lot of rounds, not a lot of weight. You got a lot of flexibility. You have a backup gun. Now, it's not equivalent. It's not as good as a 9mm for defensive use or whatever. But again, it's not your primary defensive gun. It's a backup gun in case your primary goes down in a tactical scenario. And it's a small game tool if you want to go that route. But again, hunting anything with a handgun is hard. But if, again, if you were practiced with it and you're routinely doing it now and hunting and hunting with a handgun and practicing with a handgun, then, right, that's that's not a bad option. I'm talking about thinking outside the box here. You do something like, you know, let's say your gun is a, for whatever reason, a 308 scout rifle. And then you're pairing it with a good 22 semi-auto, like a Ruger Mark IV. Right, that's that's a lot of flexibility. The other option, obviously, talked about the shotgun, is pairing the good, reasonable rate of fire shotgun, like a pump or a semi-auto, with an assortment of shells, slugs, buckshot, birdshot. And you also have the 22 handgun. You're still probably going to want birdshot, even if you have the 22, because, again, you're bugging out. So you're going through an area, and you kick up a pheasant, which are pretty common where I'm at right now, you probably get the shotgun ready with birdshot because you kick up another pheasant, you're shooting a pheasant out of the air, you're going to want a shotgun with birdshot. Now if you start seeing quail in bushes and they're stationary, then you need the 22 handgun. Why waste a shotgun shell when you don't need to? And again, it opens up a lot of flexibility and it's not a lot of weight. So I think if you got a, you know, a big bore battle rifle for your go-to or a 308 or something like a 308, I'm just picking 308 because it's common, you got something like a 30 out 6 as your primary. It, it may make a lot of sense in this kind of scenario to have a 22 as your secondary. Or if you have a shotgun, have the 22 handgun. Again, I think for me this makes a lot more sense than a single shot shotgun or a double barrel shotgun with adapters or a combo gun as cool as those are. Cuz I would want my primary gun to have a reasonable rate of fire. Anyway, those are some thoughts about just thinking outside the box. Again, bugging out. The only rules are God's laws, which don't change. And you're going to be accountable. And every every knee shall bow. One day we'll all give an account of things done. And God's law doesn't change. But if you have... If you're justified in using deadly force, you're justified in using deadly force. As far as the gun battery goes, that's on you. And we live in a golden era now of defensive and offensive 
and handguns and really good reliable semi-autos and just a smorgasbord of good options. So, again, think outside the box. Semper Gumby, as they said in the Marine Corps. Critical thinking, again, critical thinking is likely to get you out of a lot more tough situations than your caliber choice, to be real with you. But why not apply that critical thinking to your survival caliber choice? Just some thoughts. I'd love to know what you think about this. If you're listening on Spotify, you can... There's a little thing for a Q&A on there. You can scroll down and, and let me know what you think about this topic. Maybe a little bit unorthodox view on survival guns, but hey, maybe maybe unorthodox is not exactly a, a bad thing here. If you guys like this content, if you thought it was worth supporting, and if you're the kind of person that thinks I can get this for free, why, why would I pay for it? You're right, and I don't really want you as a patron. Probably not a good marketing strategy, but just whatever. If that's the kind of person you are, that's fine. If you routinely come back and listen, though, and you find value in this podcast, and you think, this is valuable to me, this is worth something, and although I could get it for free, I'm the kind of man that wants to step up and help, then consider becoming a patron, mostly because you want to help and support the podcast, and I'll be honest, I could use your help. So I would be humbled if you'd become a patron. Also, patrons get a lot of specialty insider-only content, a whole lot of it. So, there's some other value there. There's stuff on there that will never see the light of day on the regular podcast. And if you want that content, you're going to become a patron. There should be a Patreon link in the show notes if you scroll down and hit it. Tactical tip of the day. Are you going to be bugging out with your dog? I have a dog that I chose especially for survival. It's hard to find a breed that is good for... A lot of breeds will do one or the other. They're really good at guarding, but not so much hunting. I'm not talking about like they'll chase a rabbit. I'm talking about they'll routinely get out and track and point and help you get food. There are a few breeds like that. The one that I chose, Rhodesian Ridgeback. He's in front of me right now making noise as we record. But if you're planning on bugging out with your dog, hopefully he provides some of his own food and gets some of his own food, which Hamilton is pretty good at. But you still probably want to pack some food for him. One of the big go-to survival foods for centuries for people has been hardtack. If you look at the ingredients of hardtack and you look at the ingredients of a milk bone, you'll realize a milk bone is basically hardtack for dogs. So my dog has a pack. We routinely go out and do backcountry stuff. Fill his pack. Dogs are pretty cool, right? They don't need a whole lot of stuff to be happy. They need love and affection, food, water. Well, fill that pack with milk bones. Hopefully they're supplementing some of their own diet with protein. But milk bones, if you put them in a waterproof container and you don't have to get crazy, just like a Ziploc bag or a plastic bag, and fill their backpack up with milk bones... It's a good, easy snack for them. It's easy to feed them. You don't need any kind of infrastructure. You literally just give them a couple of milk bones when they're hungry. They make the jumbo, the or I don't know if they're actually jumbo. They make the large milk bones. They're pretty big. A couple of those is a decent meal. Just easy. Easy if you're going to plan on taking your dog with you. Anyway, that's your tactical tip of the day. Milk bones for your dog's bug out bag. Good canine hardtack. And it doesn't have to be Milk Bones, right? I'm not married to that brand. I'm not sponsored by Milk Bone or anything, right? Just anything. If there's a Winco where you are, they sell bulk uh, of those dry dog biscuits for a really good price. Your tactical verse of the day. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. 
reminds me of what Jesus says. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord. From the mouth of Jesus, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Right? It's not whoever pays lip service to Christ. It's whoever obeys, follows. Again, the verse we started with. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. Pretty harsh words. They're not for me. I'm just passing them on. I'm talking about harsh words, let's go back to the other verse that we read. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, <clears throat> I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. In light of those verses we just read, right? what law is he talking about? He's not talking about Roman law. He's not talking about English common law. Right? He's talking about God's law. You should probably know what God's law is and do it in light of those verses, right? So, with that, thanks for listening. Have a blessed day.